Hey everybody, this is Captain Kyle with Phantom Spotlight. I'm here with the very talented Gary Chalk. And we are going to be talking about all kinds of roles that he has had, past, future, live action, voice. But first of all, I want to say, how are you doing today, Gary? I'm doing okay. We got, you know, the usual run-of-the-mill things that happened during COVID. But uh, other than that, not so bad. Just having a good old time. I'm glad to I hear just that. finished work, actually. I finished work about an hour. So. <laughs> awesome. Hopefully, you'll be able to tell us about that later. But yeah. <laughs> um, I imagine that working from home, it's you're doing a lot more of your vastly celebrated voice work. But I'd actually like to talk about your immense body of live action work first. Yes. Which In which many of those roles put you in a uniform. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, because, yeah, well, I, I was in the Army a long time ago, and I found that I had a, a penchant for the, uh, the cop boss mentality, the, the captain, the general, the whatever. I just had the, <laughs> no pun intended, the weight for it. <laughs> they always liked it. I just, uh, for some unknown reason, I had that, that kind of capacity. And I remember uh, one time I was uh, shooting a, a, a detective show, well, a, a series called uh, Black Blackstone up in Edmonton. And I remember the deputy chief of police for Edmonton, who was who I was playing, was um, we used the real police station and the real officers. A lot of the officers in the show were real officers, right? Because uh, of the uniform budget, I guess. I don't know, but... But uh, I remember I was chewing out a guy in the office in one scene and uh, these two police officers walked up to me and they went after the scene and went, oh, my God, you sound just like our captain. You sound exactly like him. That's so weird. And uh, I had one where I, I was walking out in the park. I was doing a show called Cold Squad and I played a commander, a, a, a inspector, chief inspector. And I was on there for about seven years, I guess. And uh, a, a homicide detective, uh, I, I came to know as a homicide detective, uh, walked up to me and he said, hey, watch your interrogation the other night. And I said, yeah. He said, Dude, rock. <laughs> You've done this before, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently I do cop well. Now I do grandpas. Well, and, and military people. Of course, and military always. people. I did a. I did a. Um, I did a. Uh, well, I did Colonel Chekhov for a few years on Stargate. Oh yeah, we'll be talking about that. <laughs> yeah, and I did. Um, I did a general on the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. That was just a small part, but it was fun. It was kind of. It was kind of neat because I did the first rendition of Sonic, and then the new Sonic, new Adventures of Sonic, and then the movie. Yeah, I thought it was kind of cool. Do you think that uh, the role that you got in the Sonic movie was that related? Was it kind of an homage to your previous uh, work in Sonic, um, or was um, it just it, we need a military it, guy? It, it might have been. Um, uh, I think because of because I played uh, Doctor Robotnik in Sonic and Grounder and uh, various other parts. I think the director thought it'd be kind of cool to have this in a speaking role in the uh, in the movie, and uh, I'm sure shooting he did. It was fun. I had a great time. You did mention Colonel Chekhov, who uh, mm -hmm. I enjoyed seeing. You recently did a, a rewatch of the entire series. Oh, did you? Um, it, and it was just as glorious as the first time um, or in, and the second time. You were not only a military officer, but what was your preparation for being Russian? I mean, using that accent, to my ear, convincingly, as a well, Russian. Well, apparently to the Russians, convincingly as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Because well, I had good. Russian people come up to me and speak to me in Russian. And I went, oh, I don't speak Russian. He said, no, of course you do. And I said, no, I don't. Oh, okay. Well, you speak very well. <laughs> you sound like Stalin. Yeah, I, uh, well, what happened was, you know, that I had done MacGyver with uh, Richard, Richard Dean way back when. And Michael Greenberg and, uh, and Steve Downing, they all did, the, they were all producers on, on MacGyver. So they were the, ended up being the same producers on Stargate. Well, not Steve, but, you know, um, Greenberg and um, uh, John Smith and those people. So they said, oh, we're going to get a part for you. We're going to get a part for you. And nothing. 
no audition. Season one, season two, season three, season four. And I said, what the hell's going on? I thought you were going to give me a part. He said, no, 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 we're going to get a part. And then one day I got a phone call. We have a part for you, mister. Are you ready? And I said, oh, yeah, thanks. That's great. No, it's a great part. You got several episodes. And I said, oh, wonderful. And then they said, how's your Russian? I don't speak Russian. Oh, darn it. I thought you spoke Russian. No, no, I don't speak Russian. This is don't don't worry, don't worry. We have a tutor who's going to teach you how to speak speak Russian. So for several weeks, I was with this uh, fellow named uh, Alexander Kalugin, who also acted in Stargate as a Russian officer and also in Cold Squad as a policeman from Moscow, who is now a director in in Moscow in Russia. But I talked to him on occasion, on you know. But Alexander uh, taught me all my scenes because all my scenes were in Russian in that first episode. And I had one great long scene in Russian, and all that stuff. He taught me and he said, oh, very good. You're, done. You're very good. You've got a great ear for this. And I said, oh, thank you. Thank you. So it's fuzzy. But my first day on the show, I go in uh, to, to shoot my first scene. He said, you know, we're going to have to cut that first scene. It's just too long. We just want the last two lines. And I said, are you kidding? I worked for two solid weeks memorizing and getting the Russian for the scene down. Perfect. He said, no, well, if the show's too long, we have to cut it. And, and, and I said, I'm doing the scene. I don't give a shit. I'm doing the scene. And <laughs> they said, okay, but we're cutting it. You're only going to lose the last two lines. So I shot the whole scene and they only used the last two lines. But I had other Russian scenes in the, in the show. But it was quite fun. I had so much fun. It was, you know, because all this time, you know, you know, uh, Major Hammond or General Hammond, you, you Americans, you come first, but the Russians always end up in, in the poop. You know, it's, uh, you know, we, we always are the, the cannon fodder. We don't like it. And then you got your and, own ship. Uh, and that died. Colia, co- co- was it called the Colia? I think so. Yeah, the co- uh, Colia. And I remember, racket you! And that was with fighting, fighting the Ori. It was a glorious end. Yeah, so uh, I ended up uh, doing a few seasons of um, of uh, Cold, uh, not Cold Squad, of uh, Stargate, and it was so nice because all my old pals, you know, Don Davis and Gary Jones and Amanda Tapping, they were all good pals, and it was just like you know hanging with the family, you know, hanging with a group of friends, shooting a movie, and that scene is very familiar, uh, familiar behind you, except the gate wasn't. There, I don't think. I remember probably that. Neither was oh, no, Bernie. it was. Yeah, that's right. It's just a little narrower. Yeah, probably Bernie wasn't there. And yeah. Bernie wasn't there. No. Hi, Bern. But uh, yeah, I remember you? that. And then the, the big glass balcony was right up here. Yeah. Just up above you, yeah. Yeah, no, it was great. That is <sighs> awesome. Now, another one of your live action roles, which I was a big fan of this show, and unfortunately, it ended early. Was the uh, the Dead Zone? You played James oh, Tillman yeah. in that. Um, yeah. He was not a nice guy. Um, no, he was a bit of a brick. But his son was not exactly the saint either. No, no, neither of them were all that nice. Were you familiar with the Dead Zone prior to getting involved with that production? Or? Yeah, I re- I watched the movie with uh, who was Mr. it? Martin Walken. Sheen was the president and. Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken. Smith. Yeah, John Smith. I remember that. And I remember him getting ruined by putting the baby in front of him to shield him from the sniper. Yeah. As we mentioned, Dead Zone, you weren't a nice guy. You also nope. weren't a nice guy in Arrow um, when you were Lieutenant oh, General, General. J.G. Walker. Do, do you enjoy fun. playing playing those, you know, kind of villainous roles, you know, sometimes? Well, you see, here's the thing. Most guys who play villains are actually pretty nice guys. They're never villains. It's really hard for bad guys to play villains. The thing I like about playing bad guys, they always get the best lines. I always have a lot of fun. And the thing is, is, is my philosophy is no villain thinks they're a villain. Right. They always think they're a good guy who they're just misunderstood or they have, a, they have a cause that's bigger than both of us or whatever. And so I always played them as, I always played villains as a good guy, which made him an even more effective bad guy. And I've done a few of those. Uh, I've played a few bad guys uh, 
Airwolf, Freddy versus Jason, that one, Arrow. There was a few. Uh, the Fly 2 was another one. Yeah, and I, I just really enjoyed it. I like it. I like playing the villain. I like playing the good guys too. Like lately, I've, all I'm playing, all I'm playing is good guys. I just finished a movie uh, with uh, Peter Dinklage from the um, Game of Thrones, and- Game of Thrones, and Matt Dillon and uh, Danny Glover and uh, Shirley MacLaine, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a great vehicle for them. That uh, and it was a lot of fun. It was quite fun working with those guys. I enjoyed it very much. That's awesome. Now. I actually recently watched one of your speaking engagements from TFCon, and you said something very interesting about your relationship with Mainframe, where you were actually saying that you're kind of like very often the second choice for them, but you get a lot of roles through Mainframe. That's happened on occasion. Why do you think it is that you're like, the? what quality makes you a good second choice? And, you know, when these first choices back out or it doesn't well work out. you know a, I, I don't know why but I, I would hazard a guess i have been doing cartoons since 1982 83 long time and at that time we we're still a growing industry and they wanted to bring in a lot more voices and there was you know and some guys had uh, come in and did a really good audition and good voices and they thought finally we get someone else that we can you know bring in because I was brought in for everything, brought in for all the cartoons, you know. What happens is they do okay in the audition, but when it comes to being consistent and right, right through a cartoon series, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And uh, so I remember going into the office of the president and I'm sitting there and he goes and he brings me a maquillage or a clay statue of this character. One day and he goes, Give me a voice. Give me a voice for that. And I said, what? He says, I want a voice for that, for that character. And I said, okay. So I, I looked at him. And said, he's kind of a lizard, and he's kind of this. And yeah, hey, Joe. And he goes, that's the voice I want. All right, you start tomorrow. Well, that's very cool. And it definitely shows that, you know, as a voice actor, you definitely have to be very flexible. Yes. Now, you voiced both Optimus Prime and Optimus Primal, of course. Yes. I always think of you Optimus Primal because that's where I started with you. Uh He's back as a character um, with the new Transformers War for Cybertron Kingdom, which is a long thing to say. Have you been approached to reprise your role now? Nope. No, the whole thing has gone. uh, I think the whole thing has gone non-union. Non-union through Netflix. Okay. That's and, a shame. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so they got all different voices. Well, we're, we're, we're all of us are a little bit disappointed that uh, they didn't use us because all the fans wanted us to to be the voices, but uh, they weren't having any of it. And when I, you know, I watched the show, the first, you know, the first iteration, the production beautiful, drawing beautiful, voices. Eh. I did notice a lot of pausing in the dialogue which was very interesting to me a lot of i attempted... didn't understand that really <laughs> so that's a shame but and disappointing oh, well. but you know moving on you've had a great career met some amazing people is there a particular person that early in your career that you would say kind of took you under their wing or or served as kind of a mentor towards you kind of you know, yeah. helped you. Oh yeah, there was a few. Um, uh, there was a, a my acting teacher, or you know, the the head of the act of theater program at Langara Theater Arts, named Anthony Holland. Um, I was uh, an East End guy, so I was a bit of a. I wasn't a scrapper, but I didn't take shit. You know, I was a, I worked as a bouncer in a bar, and you know, did all that stuff. And I just didn't take shit. And uh, I remember I was doing uh, French class, I got perfect on the spoken and zero on the written. And that meant that I would probably get a C on the mark, which meant I'd be out of the program. And I said, what the hell? You can't do this. You've ruined me. You've ruined me. I've, I've, spent, I've invested a lot of time in, in this course and you're going to throw me out because I didn't. I, 
And it was a monologue, big, long monologue, Les Sauvages by Jean and me. So I got got really upset with the uh, the, uh, the teacher and told her off. And then they wanted to kick me out of the class. They wanted to kick me out of the school. Anthony brought me into his office and he said, they want me to throw you out, but I'm not going to. But don't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't. And Anthony and I became close friends, and, and it was because of him that I stayed in. And then I did a show with Jacques Brel, Live and Well Living in Paris, which sold out every single night. And they, they kept us on and paid us to do the show after our school term had ended because the show was so popular. He was instrumental in keeping me in the business. And then there was a fellow named... Uh, Hagen Beggs, who was an actor on several shows for many years, you know, he's an old veteran actor. And, and he had said to me, he said, no, man, you have got something. You're going to do it. You're in a weird age range right now. You're too old for this, too young for this, but don't give up. Keep at it. And um, I did. And that's what happened. I just, I just uh, said, no, you, you're not going to, you're not going to defeat me. And um, I just kept going with it and uh, ended up uh, where I am today, I guess. I, I did a commercial, a voice commercial. I'd never done a voice commercial. And it was for a company in Ottawa. And it was for the Ottawa Citizen. And I didn't know the read very well. I, I wasn't familiar with, you know, commercial reads. But I did this, you know, the Ottawa Citizen for latest in this and that. And they said, no, we don't like it. It's not like our guy who's not there. And so they wanted it, the Ottawa Citizen, for more intelligent sports entertainment. And I went, so I didn't know that then, but uh, I know that now. But uh, I'd never been fired from anything before. And I said to the guy, and I said to the guy uh, uh, named Chuck Rubin was his name. And I said, Chuck, if you help me with a demo tape and show me and teach me all the the ways of doing voice, like commercial voice and so on. I'll do your next commercial for free. And he said, deal. So he taught me all about um, the different kinds of reads, corporate read, retail read, man in the street read, narrator, public service, breathy, raspy, excited, standing on the edge of your feet, you know, and I did that, and he made my demo reel. And, uh, well, that demo reel in that first year made me, I don't know, $15,000. That was back then. $15,000. And it cost me the price of doing the commercial back then, which was like $300. So for $300... My career uh, blossomed into a multi-million dollar sort of deal, right? And um, it all it all went from the, my voice career anyway. All went from that that little commercial deal that I made with uh, Chuck in Ottawa all those years ago, and I'll never forget it. Now those guys were they were to me they were instrumental in shaping how my career was going to go because um well when you look at me they go oh you don't look like an actor you look like a teamster you know you you're not an actor you're not refined you're not into, you're not an artist you're a you're a craftsman now i'll never and that was another one that really cut me to the quick someone said to me one day he says you know you're not an artist i said what do you mean says, you're not an artist you're a craftsman now you're a good craftsman you're a craftsman and I said, well, that's great. And he says, yeah, well, that's the, there's a difference between an artist and a craftsman. An artist, you know, they create, they take risks, they do this, they do that. And I said, well, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, that always stuck with me as well. And um, I always thought, well, oh, I'm an artist. What are you talking about? It doesn't matter. It's all words. Words, words, words. At the end of the day, you have entertained... Millions upon millions of people, and if that's not art, I don't know what is. That's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great job, and I'm just glad that I'm in it. 
we're glad you are too. <laughs> are there some uh, upcoming projects that you can actually share with us? Yeah, well, I've got um, a movie coming up, a movie for the week uh, called Fishing for Love. I have the new season of Tribal coming up later on this year, a second season, which is going to be brilliant. Um, I have a comedy series about zombies. I can't give you the title yet, but it's a zombie comedy. Yeah, so I got that. And uh, then the the, uh, the the Peter Dinklage movie, which I can also, I can, na- I can name the characters, but I just can't uh, talk about the movie. That's and and the cartoon series and this cartoon series is going to be a, a, a pretty darn good series, I think. When you see it, that I also unfortunately can't disclose. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thanks everyone out there for watching. Um, down in the description, I'm going to put Gary's social media information so you can follow him and find out this new cartoon. That's fun. That when that comes out, I'm sure yeah. he'll talk about that. And when he can talk about other things, Uh, (laughs) which, you know, eventually will happen. But again, um, everyone have a great day. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, have fun and follow your fandom. That's right. Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share and subscribe like like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.